Of All Things by Robert C. Benchley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 Christmas Afternoon. Done in the manner, if not the spirit, of Dickens. What an afternoon! Mr. Gummidge said that, in his estimation, there never had been such an afternoon since the world began, a sentiment which was heartily endorsed by Mrs. Gummidge and all the little Gummidges, not to mention the relatives who had come over from Jersey for the day. In the first place there was the ennui, and such ennui as it was, a heavy, overpowering ennui, such as results from a participation in eight courses of steaming, gravied food, topping off with salted nuts, which the little old spinster gummage from Oak Hill said she never knew when to stop eating, and true enough she didn't. A dragging, devitalizing ennui, which left its victim strewn about the living room in various attitudes of prostration, suggestive of those of the petrified occupants in a newly unearthed Pompeian dwelling, an ennui which carried with it a retinue of yawns, snarls, and thinly veiled insults, and which ended in ruptures in the clan spirit serious enough to last throughout the glad new year. Then there were the toys, three and a quarter dozen toys to be divided among seven children, Surely enough, you or I might say, to satisfy the little tots, but that would be because we didn't know the little tots. In came baby Lester Gummidge, Lillian's boy, dragging an electric grain elevator, which happened to be the only toy in the entire collection which appealed to little Norman, five-year-old son of Luther, who lived in Rahway. In came curly-headed Effie, in frantic and throaty disputation with Arthur, Jr., over the possession of an articulated zebra. In came Everett, bearing a mechanical negro, which would no longer dance, owing to a previous forcible feeding by the baby, of a marshmallow into its only available aperture. In came Von Lansby, teeth buried in the hand of little Ormond, which bore a popular but battered remnant of what had once been the proud false bosom of a hussar's uniform. In they all came, one after another, some crying, some snapping, some pulling, some pushing, all appealing to their respective parents for aid in their intramural warfare. And the cigar smoke? Mrs. Gummidge said that she didn't mind the smoke from a good cigarette, but would they mind if she opened the windows for just a minute in order to clear the room of the heavy aroma of used cigars? Mr. Gummidge stoutly maintained that they were good cigars. His brother George Gummidge said that he, likewise, would say that they were, at which colloquial sally both the Gummidge brothers laughed testily, thereby breaking the laughter record for the afternoon. Aunt Libby, who lived with George, remarked from the dark corner of the room that it seemed just like Sunday to her. An amendment was offered to this statement by the cousin, who was in the insurance business, stating that it was worse than Sunday. Murmurings indicative of as hearty agreement with this sentiment as their lethargy would allow came from the other members of the family circle, causing Mr. Gummidge to suggest a walk in the air to settle their dinner. And then arose such a chorus of protestations as has seldom been heard. It was too cloudy to walk. It was too raw. It looked like snow. It looked like rain. Luther Gummidge said that he must be starting along home soon, anyway, bringing forth the acid query from Mrs. Gummidge as to whether or not he was bored. Lillian said that she felt a cold coming on, and added that something they had for dinner must have been undercooked. And so it went back and forth, forth and back, up and down, in and out, until Mr. Gummidge's suggestion of a walk in the air was reduced to a tattered impossibility, and the entire company glowed with ill feeling. In the meantime, we must not forget the children. No one else could. 
Aunt Libby said that she didn't think there was anything like children to make a Christmas, to which Uncle Ray, the one with the Masonic fob, said, No, thank God! Although Christmas is supposed to be the season of good cheer, you, or I for that matter, couldn't have told from listening to the little ones but what it was the children's Armageddon season, when nature had decreed that only the fittest should survive, in order that the race might be carried on by the strongest, the most predatory, and those possessing the best protective coloring. Although there were constant admonitions to Fonlandsby to let Ormond have that whistle now, it's his, and to Arthur Jr. not to be selfish, but to give the kitty car to Effie. She's smaller than you are. The net result was always that Fonlandsby kept the whistle, and Arthur Jr. rode in permanent, albeit disputed, possession of the kitty car. Oh, that we mortals should set ourselves up against the inscrutable workings of nature. Hello, a great deal of commotion. That was Uncle George stumbling over the electric train, which had, early in the afternoon, ceased to function, and which had been left directly across the threshold. A great deal of crying. That was Arthur Jr. bewailing the destruction of his already useless train, about which he had forgotten until the present moment. A great deal of recrimination. That was Arthur Sr. and George fixing it up. And finally, a great crashing. That was baby Lester pulling over the tree on top of himself, necessitating the bringing to bear of all of Uncle Ray's knowledge of forestry to extricate him from the wreckage. And finally, Mrs. Gummidge passed the Christmas candy around. Mr. Gummidge afterward admitted that this was a tactical error on the part of his spouse. I no more believe that Mrs. Gummidge thought they wanted that Christmas candy than I believe that she thought they wanted the cold turkey which she later suggested. My opinion is that she wanted to drive them home. At any rate, that is what she succeeded in doing. Such cries as there were of, Ugh! Don't let me see another thing to eat! And take it away! Then came hurried scramblings in the coat closet for overshoes. There were the rasping sounds made by cross parents when putting wraps on children. There were insincere exhortations to come and see us soon and to get together for lunch sometime. And finally there were slammings of doors and the silence of utter exhaustion while Mrs. Gummidge went about picking up stray sheets of wrapping paper. And, as Tiny Tim might say in speaking of Christmas afternoon as an institution, God help us, everyone! End of chapter 21 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina